is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. And Muhammad is not a prophet. Muhammad is not a prophet. If you want grace and mercy and love, Islam is not for you. But Jesus is the way, the truth, the way, the truth and the life. Jesus is the King of kings who died to save us all. If you just repent and believe he took your sins on the cross, then mercy and grace, forgiveness and love, eternity can be yours. But Allah is a false God, a false God, a false God. Allah is a false God, a false, false God. Allah is a false God, a false God, a false God. Allah is a false God, a false, false God. Allah is a false God, a false God, a false God. Allah is a false God, a false, false God. And Muhammad is not a prophet. Muhammad is not a prophet. If you want grace and mercy and love, Islam is not for you. But Jesus is the way, the truth, the way, the truth and the life. Jesus is the King of kings who died to save us all. If you just repent and believe he took your sins on the cross, then mercy and grace, forgiveness and love, eternity can be yours. But Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. And Muhammad is not a prophet. Muhammad is not a prophet. If you want grace and mercy and love, Islam is not for you. But Jesus is the way, the truth, the way, the truth and the life. Jesus is the King of kings who died to save us all. If you just repent and believe he took your sins on the cross, then mercy and grace, forgiveness and love, eternity can be yours. But Allah is a false God, a false God, a false God. Allah is a false God, a false, false God. If you want grace and mercy and love, Islam is not for you. But Jesus is the way, the truth, the way, the truth and the life. Jesus is the King of kings who died to save us all. If you just repent and believe he took your sins on the cross, then mercy and grace, forgiveness and love, eternity can be yours. Hallelujah, let Lord Jesus Christ shine forth. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us. Welcome to another live stream with DCCI Ministries. And tonight we do have a privilege of having David Wood with us and he's just drinking the tears of jihadis. <laughs> oh, oh by, by the way, I got a different, I got a different mug that, that, that you sent me. I don't like drinking out of it because I don't want to ruin it. But uh... don't, don't insult Aisha. <laughs> Yeah, that's glad you got that one. That was Aisha for you, in case like you wanna make use of her. Uh, how are you doing? Look, it's it's the same size as the real Aisha. <laughs> I've got I've got Sophia here. Can you pass me Sophia, sister? <laughs> um, 
No, that's not Sophia. Sophia is the one. That one, yeah. I've got Sophia, and then I got I've got Khatija. Can I have the Khatija? Khatija is the green because she was before Islam. So I've got Khatija here. Khatija here. She was, she's like very colorful because before Islam. Mm -hmm. And then I've got Sophia here. She's mm -hmm. working very hard. And then uh, you got Aisha saying, uh, "Hey, Prophet, Allah." hastens to satisfy your wishes and desires every time you want something you get a revelation what's up with that well, by the way for those who don't know that's an actual quotation <laughs> from aisha she noticed hey every time muhammad has some perverted sexual desire or something like that he gets a i'm receiving a revelation the lord has told me that I get that perverted thing that I want. And she noticed this and she commented on it. It's uh, interesting. Well, well she, uh, she knew um, her husband is up to something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's kind of obvious, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because she was, she was the only person who usually had the, had the guts to say it. So. <laughs> yeah, what was happening in the bedroom as well as what was happening outside of the bedroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you, when you are um, very young, you don't think what are the things you can share publicly. So she was in that stage. Yep, little 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 tiny little tiny kids. They just they just blurt things out. Um, how are you doing? Good, good, good. Good. Um, so, um, those of you who are joining us in the chat, um, what we will be doing is tonight we will be just looking back this year. Um, on Islam, maybe also on freedom of speech, what's happening in the world. If you want to get my attention, please put at sign in front of DCCI Ministries and um, hopefully we will see your comment and if it, your comment is in question form, we might even ask that question to David to see if he is able to answer those amazing arguments Muslims are putting forward. Um, this might be the night maybe David will say, well, I have no idea how to answer that objection since Muhammad is so perfect, man. Uh, yep, he certainly was. <laughs> um, yeah, since then, um, I believe Oxford Dictionary is working to change the definition of the perfect to protect the protected group. Mm -hmm. um, that was just a joke in case people didn't get that one. Um, so um, I've been just looking at your channel and I noticed that... Um, in 2021, um, it's been a year for you that your freedom of speech is being banned by YouTube quite a lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got I got banned a ton. And the thing was, it was uh, I would I would almost always win the appeal like I, I but it was like every week I was getting banned for something and then I would appeal and I would win it. But sometimes they take a week to get back to you on the appeal. Sometimes they get back to you like, like an hour later or something like that. And so, but uh, yeah, it was just, I was already in a situation where like I was staying up, uh, staying up all night and, and uh, sleeping during the day. And so as far as recording, cause I'm at, I'm at, I'm at the end of my bedroom right now the bedrooms uh, that way like my, my bed's right in on the other side of this computer so for my wife to be sleeping and so on for my wife to be sleeping i can't be in here and recording so i had like a small window a small window of space to actually record and so on and uh just with the constant bands i'd be like eh, i guess i'll record tomorrow and eh, i guess i'll do something tomorrow and so for a long time i was just like let let them sort out this uh this uh this banning situation because what they did because of COVID, they didn't have people working in the office as much. They programmed bots to go and take people's stuff down looking just for, for keywords and they would just ban all kinds of people's stuff. If it sounded like it was, you know, Islamophobic or something like that. And then they leave it to you to kind of defend your stuff and say, actually, it's not hate speech. It's not that. Uh, so a lot of it I think was bots, but I've always I've always had a ton of people filing false complaints about my videos. But uh, there was a greater emphasis this year on filing false complaints um, because, 
the uh, the Dawa community is getting a little more desperate because of the the, the avalanche of apostasy and, and so on. So they're trying more and more to control people's speech. Um, yeah. Anyway, I was just in a situation where uh, I was getting lots of false strikes, was taking a while. And I was just saying, I don't care. I, I'm just not going to mess with this for a while. But uh, no, I'm back now. I'm back now posting. And so even with the false strikes, I'll I'll, I'll win. I've, that, the plus side is I've won every one this year and it's been a lot of them it, it seemed like i was getting one or two per week for a while that's died down so it's gotten better but uh i've i've eventually won all of them uh most of them i won on appeal and then the remain the ones i lost actually won once once people complained on twitter and then they took another look at it and fixed it so uh i think i've won all of them this year eventually but yeah um i i do follow not all of, but most of your work. And all I am observing is all you are doing is mainly um, giving quotation from Islamic sources. Why do you think giving quotation from Islamic sources is hate speech now? Yeah, well, it, it, it's not. It, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit um, YouTube's definition of what hate speech is. Uh, but many in the... Zakir Naik and Dawa community and so on regarded as hate speech because we're using it to criticize Islam. It's, but they can't just say, hey, this is, you know, offensive stuff. So what they'll do is they'll they'll complain, oh, this is making us feel threatened because when he criticizes Muhammad, that's like violence, which if you think about it, that's the way it is in Islam, right? If you say someone else has a false religion, that's a call for violence against them because Islam calls for violence against uh, people of other religions. And so it just seems to be built into their mindset that when you're criticizing their religion, you're calling for violence against their community because that's the way Islam is. Guys, get it through your heads. We can criticize your religion all day long. It's got nothing, zero to do with any sort of call for violence. Um, I mean, if you, if you go, if you take a philosophy class, especially if you get to graduate level in philosophy, all you do is attack everyone else's positions. Everyone all day long attacks each other's position. No one is calling calling for violence. So, yeah, it's just a it's just a problem that you've got this hypersensitive religion that uh, encourages people to get super hurt feelings, and yet at the same time, that super hurt feelings religion also has the most ridiculous prophet in history. Like if you made a list of every stupid, ridiculous characteristic a false prophet could have that would prove conclusively that he's a false prophet. If you made a list like that, Muhammad had all of them. Muhammad had every possible feature. I mean, you're talking about a guy who, he's the one who said he was demon possessed. If, 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 you, if, if you right now say, I think Muhammad was demon possessed, they'd say, oh, that's racist and bigoted and Islamophobic. Wait, Muhammad is the first one who said he thought he was demon possessed. Well, not the first one because his uh, his foster parents, when he was a little kid, thought he was demon possessed. That's why they sent him back to his mom. So multiple people long before us thought this guy uh, had some problems with demons, um, tries repeatedly to kill himself. Um, I mean, the, your, your, your pattern of conduct is someone who, whenever something didn't go right, would run and say, I'm going to hurl my, myself off a cliff. I mean, that sounds like borderline personality disorder, right? It's characterized by these ongoing... Uh, suicide attempts whenever something doesn't go your way. I mean, he claimed to be a, a victim of black magic that was giving him delusional thoughts and false beliefs, at, walking around, babbling all this weird stuff. Eventually he says, oh, it's because that, that Jewish magician cast a spell on me. Now just think, I mean, my goodness, uh, Hatun, how many times has a spell taken you out, right? I'm sure if there were a spell that could take you out, people would be using that that magic on us to take us out. I did have a, a high priest of Wicca once used a spell to try and take us out, not kill us, but to try to keep us from, from confronting him. That dude cast a spell on, on me and a couple other Christians. He died. He died. I'm not saying it's the Almighty who killed him. I don't know. But I know a spell didn't work. I know a spell didn't work, but you're telling me You've got Allah's last and greatest messenger, and you could get a hair from his hairbrush, cast a spell, and boom, this guy's all disoriented and weird for, for a, a period of between, it was between six months and two years that he's acting like a nutcase. 
in, in, I mean, even more so than than normal when he would act like a nutcase. Uh, but you got that. You got the satanic verses where he walks out and tells his followers it's okay to pray to these three pagan goddesses because they'll just care, carry you know carry your prayers up to Allah. So it's okay to have them as mediators. Then he comes back later and says, "Oops, the devil made me do it." And then you've got you know all this stuff about um, having getting revelations telling him to have sex with a, a prepubescent little girl, getting revelations telling him to take the wife of his own adopted son, uh, getting caught having sex with his slave girl, making an oath to his wives that he would never do it again, and then getting a revelation telling him break your oath, go start having sex with your uh, with your slave girl again. Um, it, you just look at this, and then you know with the the, the killing of dogs with everything this guy did it's so it's so weird your average muslim doesn't know about any of it i mean if they've heard anything now they've heard aisha but if you go back 10 years they hadn't even heard about aisha because their leaders their entire lives keep them insulated from hearing all of this information um and so and they have to do that in order to try to keep them in islam because they know they know once muslims find out all this stuff about muhammad you you can't you can't turn around and say oh by the way he's the great pattern of conduct for all mankind as the Quran says in Surah thirty three verse twenty one Muhammad is a beautiful pattern of conduct so yeah that's a uh, that's the situation so it, all, all they can all they can try to do now is keep people from talking about this stuff and they do that just by just with manipulation saying oh this is this is hate speech when someone points out these facts from our sources and it's 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 just to try to make the rest of the world do what they do. Muslim leaders keep this information hidden. They keep it concealed. All of a sudden, we non-Muslims get a hold of their sources. We start telling Muslim the Muslim community what's in their sources. And then they start leaving Islam in droves. Muslim leaders want to stop that. And so now they, they're programming people to uh, complain that everything is hate speech and get people shut down. Because uh, it, it's, it's very clear. I mean... It's still a tiny fraction of people in the world who know this information. And Islam is already facing an avalanche of apostasy. Imagine what would happen if this just became common knowledge. Imagine if every person you ran into on the street, they all knew that Muhammad said you could beat your wives into submission and that you have to kill apostates and that it was okay to hire prostitutes. Uh, imagine if this was and, and that, you, you know, you breastfeed adults. Uh, women can can breastfeed adult men with beards so that there's no sexual attraction between them. Uh, it's just insane. And Muslims don't know it's there. We do, We know it's there. We want to tell people there and it's there. And the Muslim leaders are doing everything they can to stop us from making this stuff known. Yeah. Um, there's a question um, on the, I just put that on the screen, but um, before that, I just want to, I was speaking with a um, couple of groups a uh, couple of weeks ago from, Egypt, um, Egypt, Turkey, and Malaysia. So we are working with people who left Islam and become a Christian. We do online discipleship classes with them. And uh, they express their concerns, like number of Muslims who are leaving Islam is pretty mm -hmm. high in those countries. So Egypt, Turkey, and Malaysia. Um, therefore, they are seeing like um, re reasons to be equipped so that they can preach the gospel to those people who are leaving Islam. So Egypt is becoming more apostate <laughs> as well as Turkey and Malaysia. Um, so there is a question on what are the differences between continental and analytical philosophy and uh -huh. parallels of those to, to Islam and Christianity? Uh, I'm not sure about parallels between Islam and Christianity, unless I was to make a very loose one, but I'm not a good person to comment on continental philosophy because i i regard it as a, a lot of gibberish okay. <laughs> um, like yeah so i would be in the uh contemporary analytic uh tradition and there they focus on being very clear on what you mean in definitions and then being consistent with the use of those definitions and proceeding in step-by-step -step fashion building up your case from one point to the next and uh yeah continental philosophy and and See, here's what's weird. I know this is not correct, but basically, you know, I read Plato and I I, I get it. I read Aristotle, I get it. I read, uh, you know, Descartes, perfectly clear, Hume, perfectly clear. Uh, and then you get down to modern analytical, Alvin Plantinga and so on. Then it's all, it's it's just crystal clear. 
And I just remember in, in philosophy classes, we would have to read something from continental philosophy and I would read it, not understand anything it's saying, read it again, not understand it, read one sentence, couldn't understand a sentence. And you start thinking, you start thinking, it's because they're not saying anything. <laughs> it's because the continental philosophers aren't saying anything at all. And it's just a bunch of, it's just a bunch of uh, gibberish. And uh, I don't think that's true. I just think my brain is wired. Certain people's brains are wired more for analytical philosophy. And some people's brains are probably wired a little more for continental philosophy. Now, if I were to try to make a parallel, um, I would say, well, you know, you can actually build up a case for the resurrection in, in step by step, very careful fashion and so on. Whereas Muhammad spouted a bunch of, of weird gibberish like continental philosophy. So continental philosophy is out there, uh, philosophers out there, uh, you're more like Muhammad. But I think that's, I, I, I'm not serious about that parallel. I don't think there's a, unless you're thinking something else, but yeah. Um, okay. There is a kind of comment um, from James. Um, he's expressing uh, you have been huge help um, to him regarding him to address Islam as well as you helped him uh, in his personal walk. Um, so thank you very much for um, serving us, David, and helping us to incline our hearts towards Lord Jesus Christ. We met with a lady actually today where she expressed first time she kind of got to know about Islam through your videos and that was um, your channel was very small back in um, early days. And still she mm -hmm. follows um, your work and she uses them in her engagement with Muslims. So thank you very much for um, serving not only us, but almost the um, rest of the world as well. Yeah, um, I, I, re I remember the early days. I remember when I would make a video and I would be excited if it got a thousand, a thousand views by the next day. And so, yeah, the, the, that was back in the day. Okay. Um, Chris is asking the question of... Are you still looking for apologetics for, apologies for your apologetic army? Um, yeah, I just uh, with the way things have gone since COVID and me being uh, sort of massively, massively, well, how do I put this? not in a position most of the time to be interacting with people because I'm a, I'm a, I'm asleep during the day and, and awake during the night. So I haven't been able to organize much, but, uh, things, uh, things, things will work out. Yeah, we are going to, we are, we are going to do that. Um, and again, the, the, I mean, the project we were, I mean, we were actually about to start it completely. I posted the first video, uh, but the, the project we were talking about a, a couple of years ago was, uh, putting out a series of 50, videos dealing with Islam and Christian apologetics. And uh, people were going to translate them and re-record them in their own language. So not just adding subtitles, people are going to re-record them in their own language. A ton of people from countries all over the world saying they would be happy to do that in their language. And then, uh, yep, I don't even remember what happened, but I mean, whatever, whatever happened, it was on, it was on me. It was on me. I dropped the ball on that one, but we, we, yeah, we'll 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 get back to it. We'll uh, we're definitely that's something. That's one of the things I want to accomplish before uh before uh this old chunk of coal, as Norm Macdonald would say, before this old chunk of coal heads off into the great yonder. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so there is a kind of just um, how would you respond to a Muslim or Muslim missionary in this occasion? It's Muslim missionary when they simply say, um, yes, um, we trust Bukhari, we trust uh, Muslim, but we don't trust them 100%. They are not authentic 100%. What would you say to them when they do cherry picking when it comes to the Islamic tradition? Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I would agree with them. So you'll have Muslims who treat uh, Bukhari and Muslim as, as, good, as good as gold. Then you'll have, you know, people on the different side, like you'll have Shias and so on who uh, you can't trust. You can't trust those sources. There's too much Aisha, too much Abu Bakr involved and so on. So don't trust, trust those sources. Um, so you'll, you'll have, you'll have people who think it's as good as gold and people who think you can't trust it at all. And then you've got all the people there in the middle. And so if you have some good reason for not trusting something in Bukhari, 
like you know mufti abu Laith will will criticize things in bukhari but it's it's uh it might be here's a reason i don't trust it but what the method you actually find most muslims using is i don't like that hadith therefore i'm going to say it's not reliable yeah. and so the the general response is what are you talking about i'm quoting bukhari here that's your best source that's what you guys tell me is your best i don't think that's their best source i would say ibn asak is a better source but uh you guys tell me Bukhari and Muslim are your best sources. So I'm quoting those and they, well, we can't even trust those. And what they really mean is that's something so embarrassing about my prophet that either I can't believe that it happened or at the very least, I don't want you to use it against me. And so I'm just going to say, I don't even trust Bukhari and Muslim enough. And guys, it's, I mean, if you think their methodology was flawed, if you think the methodology of Bukhari and Muslim is flawed, then you've got a problem because then everything's under investigation. I mean, just think if you're, if, if let's suppose your secret service, right? Your secret service, those are the people who have to protect the president in the United States. So if you have secret service and the president is speaking at some event and secret service, they're checking people as they walk through the door. They're checking every person as they walk through the door. They're making people go through a metal detector. They're checking and they're patting them down and so on. And then they're letting them in. Well, if all of a sudden everyone's inside, and then some guy pulls out an AK-47 that does it. So the Secret Service would jump on that guy and stop him. But notice, if if they jumped on that guy and that guy managed to get an AK-47 past security, past the Secret Service, that doesn't just mean that guy's a threat who needs to be taken out. It means your entire system is flawed. Your entire system for checking people as they walk through the door is flawed. Yeah. And for all you know, every last person in there could have an AK-47 because your system, your system for checking people is flawed. It's like that with your sources. If they had a flawed methodology and they're letting in flawed information, and it's passing the same criteria, it's all it's all meeting the criteria of Bukhari and Muslim, and yet it's false. Well then. I mean, couldn't it all be false? I mean, I don't know. It's, it's passing the same standards. Yeah. Well, where is the line? When are, when are you going to pull the line? When you uh, only uh, just pick the hadiths you like, but that's not going to give you full Islam. Um, you did express regarding the, um, how uh, Miss YouTube is kind of taking your freedom of speech away by being tool or being dimmy to uh, Muslim missionaries. Uh, I think it was on Wednesday uh, there was news uh, on the radio talking about how um, Islamophobia law is about to pass through in the state. Mm -hmm. What is the applications of that um, to, let's say, Christians who are engaging with uh, Islam? Well, that's the thing. We don't know because they don't define it, right? So the law just says that the government is going to have a special envoy uh, so some sort of special uh, assigned person who's in charge of, and the creepy part is they say combating Islamophobia, and it's it's not just in the in the U.S. It's it's the United States government is now supposed to combat Islamophobia on a global scale, and the problem is they don't define Islamophobia, and you know this as well as I do, as well as Robert Spencer, as well as anyone who deals in Islamic apologetics. Anytime we quote Muhammad and criticize it at all, we're called Islamophobes. So now you've got the U.S. government. It already passed the, the House of Representatives. It passed. Um, so it goes to the Senate. And then I would say it's likely to pass the Senate because it's a lot of the same, uh, same kind of uh, thinking there. Uh, and so and the president's already said he's going to sign on. So it's actually going to looks like it's going to be the law in the United States that the federal government, the executive branch of the federal government is assigned to combat Islamophobia, where Islamophobia is not defined. And well, if it's not defined, then, I mean, keep in mind, they don't just use Islamophobia to, to uh, say, hey, if, you're, if you attack a Muslim just because he's a Muslim, guess what? That's already against the law. That's what, there's, there are already laws against that. You can't do that. So what is this extra thing, Islamophobia? Well, we know that Islamophobia is just a tool for shutting down speech, saying, ah, you brought up this information about Muhammad, therefore you're an Islamophobe. So, yep, it's pretty pretty darn creepy that this is now a thing in the U.S. And, and that's the concern of people who didn't sign the bill, is that it's actually going to be used to block what used to be protected speech in the United States. It used to be in the United States, unless you're calling openly calling for violence or something like that, some very limited categories, you can say pretty much whatever you want. They had a very high view of freedom of speech. And now 
well, nope, you're saying something that is Islamophobic and the government has to crack down on you. So, yeah. Just such a shame. Um, the freedoms people fight for, um, we are just letting them go very easily to just protect the protected group. Um, protect feelings. You gotta protect the feelings. Uh, yes. Feelings are matter. We need to respect the feelings. We need to protect the feelings of the protected group. Otherwise, they are just like crushed. <laughs> they are just yeah. crushed. And, but 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 it's crazy. As soon as they as soon as they start saying things like that, like uh, because what what they'll say is, you know, freedom of speech does not mean the freedom to offend people. As soon as you say, wait a minute, your book offends me. Your book calls me the worst of creatures. Your book your book calls you to fight. Ah, how dare you? You're hurting my feelings again. It's like, wait a minute. Why are you the? Why do you have the only feelings in the world that count, and no one else's feelings matter at all? Yes, yeah. <laughs> funny stuff. Such a shame, such a shame. Um, I am not sure what I can do to make sure like people cares about my feelings. I don't know how how can I pour out my heart so that people care about my feelings too. You gotta you gotta cry more. <laughs> I don't think that just, will just work. <laughs> I don't think that will work. Um, but so um, um, this year. Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm not sure if you picked up as well, but um, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia uh, decided he wants to get rid of um, some of the Sahih Hadiths and then keep only the Mutawatir ones. Smart, smart. <laughs> uh, is that what you think about it? Well, yeah. Good I, I mean, Muslims? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I think, I mean, no, smart for him. I, I'm not saying it's, it's good or right. <laughs> it's smart for him. Um, but yeah, if you look at, I, I think that's a, I think he, <laughs> I think he wants to uh, sort of block Islam a bit more from criticism as far as a lot of the, the stupid things that are going on, try to bring it a little bit more into the mainstream world while still being a messed up person behind the scenes, but just try to keep that uh, secret. And it, it's just a, I mean, it's kind of just a matter of time. I mean, they have to, right? You can't be in, in, imposing all these weird teachings on society and take take all these weird teachings seriously and then expect to be taken seriously um, around the world and not be and not be criticized for these insane, stupid teachings. And so I think we're going to be seeing more and more of that. And we see it from we see it from our Muslim friends all the time. We bring up a hadith, they reject it. We bring up a hadith, they reject it. We bring up a hadith, they reject it. And so it's a matter of time where you get, you know, that becomes popular enough that governments start throwing things out and so on. And yep, they're, uh, it's, just, it, it's just a result of constantly watering down Islam uh, that we are getting this uh, sort of Walt Disney version of Islam that was that previously was just used for apologetics purposes, just to just to trick people into not having objections against Islam. But once you get enough people believing that stuff, yeah, yeah. And uh, some people in um, apologetic, apologetics world were like kind of not happy the statements he made, but um, they didn't get that much platform to express that. Uh, also this year, um, we had um, Taliban took over Afghanistan. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, that was big there. What are your thoughts and actually what are your feelings about it in case like I don't want you at the end you tell me like you didn't care about my feelings and you didn't ask about my feelings. Yeah. Uh, well, <clears throat> well, it, it, it's like it's a situation where the reason lots of people would be in favor of getting out of there is that you, you you don't want these perpetual wars going on you don't want you know people I, i'll give both i'll give both sides i'll give the side for getting out and the side for 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 staying there um you, you could argue that shouldn't have been there or something like that the, the the thing is okay here's the situation we found ourselves in this year regardless of what you think about the past and whether it was a good idea to invade and things like that the situation we're in right now this year was uh we're in the situation where for decades now, we've been in this country. Do we want to stay there forever? And the case against it, I mean, the, the, the case against leaving, it's got the case for leaving, the case against leaving. The case against leaving is as soon as you leave, we know who's taken over. And it's only, it looked like it would only be 
a couple thousand people who would be required to stay there. And then you could basically keep the Taliban out of power forever with a force of a couple thousand people who are basically the backup for the, the Afghani soldiers. And the idea is the Afghani soldiers do not function well on their own. Um, and, and, that's that's not you know that's not to insult them a group like the taliban is incredibly hard to fight it's incredibly difficult to fight people who fight like that you know caves and they know the trails and they have people in every community who are willing to help them and give them cover and they have no qualms about blowing up schools blowing up mosques and so on very difficult for any for any uh, army to fight them um and so the case was well with with a with a couple thousand people there acting as backup for the Afghan military, uh, you could keep the Taliban out of power indefinitely. So that that's that's the idea there. The, the case for getting out is, do you really want to just keep sending US soldiers to something that you're never going to win? Uh, because some, pe some people would say, look, if you're, if you're going to fight a war, you fight it, go ahead and fight it to win. Don't just, oh, we kind of got our objective and now we're just going to just going to draw this out forever. All right. So if you're, you're if you're fighting, then go all out, conquer everyone that you're there to conquer, find them all. And, you know, and and then you've won and then then figure things out. Uh, the, 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 the problem that people have is, is everyone. You've got the people who thought we should remain there just to keep the Taliban out of power. And you had the people who say we should have gotten out. The problem was we got out in the like stupidest way imaginable. I mean, like if you if you sat down and said, I'm going to come up with the dumbest plan for leaving Afghanistan that I could possibly come up with, that went beyond it. That was like beyond stupid. I mean, like I'm, I'm talking like leaving massive amounts of weapons and vehicles. I mean, there were these <laughs> there are these videos of the Taliban trying to learn to fly these Black Hawk helicopters that were left behind. And they're trying, they're, they're like, they don't know how to fly them yet. So they're driving them around on the, on the tarmac at airport. They're just driving, they're using these, they're using Black Hawk helicopters as, as cars on the tarmac, driving these things around. And the thing is, they can find people to, who can train them to use that stuff, right? There are people yeah. that they can find who can train them how to use that equipment. There are people in the Afghan military who know how to use that equipment, and that you can say, okay, we won't execute you if you teach us how to join us and teach us how to use this stuff. And so you just ended up with the the best terrorist military in the world all of a sudden, um, which notice you, you didn't have to do that. You didn't have to be that stupid. You could have made sure you could have made sure they didn't get a hold of that stuff. So yeah, it was just a big screwed up situation. And then we see afterwards, and, it, and it's only it's only been getting worse because you got the Taliban taking over and now people are starving. I, I don't know if you've been yeah. following this, but I've been seeing like uh, families having to sell their little girls uh, to much older men, people yeah. like Muhammad, uh, selling their little girls uh, as wives to these much older men. And the girls are terrified, but the, it, it's I have to sell my daughter or the rest of my family starves. If I sell her, at least she'll be fed and at least we'll eat. And but but the families are like, you know, we've got we've got six kids, so we're going to sell one. And then, you know, a few months from now, when we're all starving again, we're going to have to sell another one. And yeah. uh, so it's just a it's a pretty, it pretty was, bad situation. It was one thousand six hundred dollars for nine years old girl <clears throat> when she was sold. Yeah. Yeah, the guy should have just uh, the guy should have just claimed to be a prophet, and then people would give them their give them All their of, daughters. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is a question. Um, um, what do you think about um, France changing their stance on Islam? You, what do you mean about becoming uh, becoming more aggressive in, against it? Um, I think in the context, I don't know what is the background of the question, but I'm assuming so. Back uh, in the back in days when uh, Charlie Hebdo Charlie Hebdo killings took place, they all mm. stand against like okay, we will deal with Islam. We won't allow freedom of speech to be taken away, and that was the case um, in last couple of years. But now it seems they are like more scared by Islam, and they are not standing the way they used to stand. So it's like more shutting down the freedom of speech in a sense actually uh yeah i'd have to Becoming see what more friendly towards islam now 
Oh, really? Yeah, uh, I'd have to see what 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 Sean means here because uh, you you you've you've basically got two trends. You've got well, because of all the stuff, all the terrorist attacks and so on, um, you've got people who are trying to elect leaders and so on who are going to do something more about it. But then as soon as you start doing that, then you get the backlash against that. Ah, you're being a bunch of Islamophobes and bigots. And so notice you're, you're just, you're going to have that everywhere. You're going to have that same reaction everywhere uh, because France has a, has a pretty high Muslim population as yeah. far as, as Western countries. Um, if the po if the population's around like one percent, generally not a lot of problems, except for a you know an, an occasional uh, terrorist attack. Once you start getting seven percent, eight percent, nine percent, ten percent, I mean it's just it, it just massively escalates, and then it's just you know reg just regular routine, constant attacks, harassment, things like that. And so uh, yeah, it's something it's something. It, it's something everyone's going to have to go through as as Islam spreads. Like, how do you how do you deal with that? Because you're going to get you're going to get a bunch of people who start saying, "Hey, uh, we're kind of fed up with this." And I mean, at the end of the day, Western nations are you know people vote, people vote, and so you get enough people who are ticked off, then they're going to start voting people into power. But then, what are those people in power going to do if they look like they're being a you know? going too far or something like that, then you get a backlash against that. So yeah, we're, we're, we're I think we're going to be seeing that a lot from, from France. And, 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 and the thing is look, look at France and then the UK is not far behind. Uh, whatever so, happens in France, you're going to be seeing that pretty soon in the UK. Yeah. We've got like approximately 12% um, is 12% of London is Muslim. Mm -hmm. And clearly they are ruling. <laughs> it's only 12%, but um, they are ruling. That's all you need. And, and so, and so that, that works up until a point where people, people start realizing, wait a minute, you know, if this small percentage gets you all of these problems, uh, wait a minute, this is something that's going to, that's not just going to affect me. It's going to affect my kids and my kids, kids. And, we got some problems with the teachings of this ideology. And so, yeah, you, you, you're going to get, you're going to get some feedback from people. Um, sadly, it seems like our government in UK government doesn't that much concerned on um, danger of Islam. They are more concerned of um, feeling or uh, hurting the feelings of the protected group. Um, when you look um, into 2021, this year, what are the kind of uh, things inside of Islam got your attention or made you concern? Oh, as far as, I mean, well, here, here, here's the situation you have, right? So you've heard about this avalanche of apostasy, right? Yeah. Okay, so if you go back to 2006, 2007, and so on, there weren't a lot of ex-Muslims who were sort of public about being ex-Muslims. There, the, the number was small enough that Muslim apologists, and it was just common among Muslims to say, no one ever leaves Islam. No one has ever left Islam. And so it was common to just say that apostasy is not a thing, even though they had apostasy wars. Right As soon as Muhammad died, then they had to fight apostasy wars because so many people were leaving Islam. They had to fight wars over it. Um, but somehow no one leaves Islam, even though e e even during the lifetime of Muhammad, people were leaving Islam, like Abdullah ibn Abi Sar, who realized that Muhammad was a false prophet, was one of Muhammad's scribes yeah. and left Islam. So you got people. like So you had apostasy during the lifetime of Muhammad. Uh, you had tons of apostasy after he died. It was no longer around to uh, to threaten them with death. Um, and then, of course, you have. Uh, tons of apostasy now, but I mean, just think about how much it's changed in the last 15 years, where 15 years ago, they could still say, no one leaves Islam. It's not a thing that happens. And now you look at their videos and they're the ones talking about the avalanche of apostasy, the tsunami of apostasy. Another Muslim uh, scholar said that there are millions of ex-Muslims in Muslim countries uh, who just can't, who just can't be honest about leaving Islam because they're worried about their families. And then Abdullah Samir just recently posted a clip from Asadullah Ali, 
who is saying that he has personally met, he has personally met hundreds of apostates who are still living as Muslims. They're, they're, they're young Muslims. They're actually apostates. They don't believe it, but they still lead prayers in the mosque. They're still, they're, they still memorize the Quran. Yeah. They're still in madrasa. They're still doing all the things that a Muslim would do. Uh, you would look at it and say, wow, this is a great Muslim. If you challenge them, they'd still defend Islam, but it's all fake. It's all fake. It's all just because they're scared of, you know, their family's reaction or they're scared of the reaction of their community or their, their imam, but they're confiding in him behind the scenes. Yes, I'm actually, uh, I'm actually an ex-Muslim. Now, if he says personally, he knows hundreds of these people. Think about how many people don't confide that to him. Yep. Like they, they're ex-Muslims. They don't tell anybody. They don't tell this, this, this random guy who shows up. So you're talking, this guy's probably... It's, it's basically every Muslim in every mosque, there's probably apostates all around you and you just don't realize it because they're just going through the motions. And that's true in Muslim countries around the world. And so Muslims are warning people about this avalanche of apostasy. And they know ba basically why, how did things change so much in the past decade that now we've got this avalanche of apostasy. So that was that's that's been sending them into panic mode. And then the other thing that was sending them into panic mode last year, so 2020, was a bunch of their arguments started unraveling and it started becoming common knowledge that certain arguments were total garbage, like the perfect preservation of the Quran. And then with the holes in the narrative interview, then everyone starts saying, wait a minute. I mean, it's a pretty straightforward question. Yasser Khadi, has the Quran been perfectly preserved or not? Uh, I don't want to talk about that. Wait a minute. Why, why don't you want to talk? I mean, that's that's the, that should be the main thing we want to talk about, the perfect preservation of the ground. Tell us about the perfect, pres perfect preservation of the ground. We should not be having this conversation here. This is a bad conversation. Don't push me. Don't push me on this. Right? And it's like, wait a minute. And then everyone sees that and they start realizing, wait a minute, you guys have been lying to us the entire time. Scholars have been lying to us talking about And keep in mind, that was Yasser Khadi. Yasser Khadi is one of the main ones who's who's been lying about this for years. You can look, you can look at video clips of Yasser Khadi that are made for a popular audience that are made for dawa purposes yeah. and he says perfect preservation since the time of uthman right down to the letter not a single letter's difference since the time of uthman does he know that's a lie yes 100 percent. because if you look at his talks that are made for what who he calls students of knowledge people who are studying and who are going to look at manuscripts and find all these differences and so on he says yes if you go to different parts of the world and you're familiar with this uh if you go to different parts of the world you find different qurans you find different Qurans with different letters, different words, and so on. And so basically the Muslim community is, wait a minute, you've been telling us our entire lives, perfect preservation right down to the letter. Now we're finding out it's all a lie. It's all a lie. If you've been lying to us about this, what else have you been lying to us about? And so then you have uh, the arguments start to unravel. And so that was the situation last year. They're concerned about this, um, this uh, tsunami of apocalypse to see and they're concerned that their arguments are starting to fall apart then we get to 2021 and the question is what are you going to do about that now what are you what are you now going to do about that uh, islam is falling apart what's clear is you can't keep doing things the same way you did them before the way we've been doing things before in the past it's not working islam is crumbling so we need to change something up and i've seen two different ways of doing things this year. I've seen two things happen this year in 2021 that are sort of the main trends in Islamic apologetics uh, in Islamic dawah to try and deal with that. And one, one way of dealing with things is to say, well, the reason Islam is crumbling is because we're not preaching true authentic Islam. We've been preaching a watered down, whitewashed Walt Disney version of Islam. Of course, that's not spreading. It's not true. And of course, Allah is not going to bless us. Allah is going to punish us. He's going to punish us for preaching this false Islam. So there's no way we can take over the world and subjugate people with this false version of Islam we're presenting. And so we need to present a true version of Islam. And so there, then you have the rise in popularity of people like Daniel Hakikachu, who acknowledges, yes, of course you beat women into submission. Of course you do. They need that. It's good for them. Uh, of course. Uh, Muhammad uh, and, and the early Muslims took took sex captives and you had to. The, so many people are dying that they needed those sex slaves and they needed to ha have sex with their their sex captives and so on. So he's taking all these things that um, 
for decades, Muslim scholars and apologists have told us that that's not, that's not a thing in Islam. That's a lie. And he's just being, now he's being honest about it. What's the penalty for, what's the penalty for leaving Islam? Death. T just 10 years ago, if you said that to any Muslim apologist, what's the penalty for, for leaving Islam? There's no penalty for leaving Islam. What are you talking about? What about all these commands to kill people who leave Islam? No, that was saying that if they leave Islam and then they go join another military and then they come and attack you, you defend yourself against that apostle. Wait a minute. Why would you need a command about that? Obviously, if an army's attacking you, you could defend yourself against it. What's the command for killing the apostate? And so, uh, but just 10 years ago, almost any Muslim apologist or scholar you talk to would say that. We were called bigots and racists and Islamophobes for saying that Islam promotes wife beating, for saying that they would take uh, sex captives, for saying that there's a death penalty in Islam, for, for, for saying any of these things, we were called racists and bigots. Now, You've got Muslim apologists saying, yes, it's all true. And Muslims are saying, Alhamdulillah, you tell those you tell those kufar that this is the truth about Islam. And so now you've got tons of people admitting it and saying this is true. And th the reason this is now becoming popular is, again, we have to change something. Our whitewashed, watered down version of Islam is only leading to apostasy. We need to crack down, promote uh, pure Islam, and then Allah will bless us and we'll take over. Notice, it's the same mindset as ISIS, right? ISIS looked back, hey, what's going on in the world? Well, the, the problem is we, we need to cleanse the, the Muslim community of hypocrisy and uh, false views and innovation. We need to cleanse it just like Abu Bakr did when he fought the apostate wars, the original Abu Bakr. There's no coincidence that the leader of ISIS gave himself the name Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Uh, we're going to cleanse the Muslim community just as Abu Bakr did. And so that's one reaction that I've seen this year, people trying to go back to a more authentic version of Islam in a, in, in a, in a fit of desperation, they're trying to do that. So that's one. And the other direction you're going to is, is, is hilarious, but it's, it's, it's the idea of Muhammad Hijab and Ali Dawah, that if we can just get popular Westerners to share their platforms with us, we can use the same arguments, the same lies that we've been telling for years that people are catching on to. But if we can get those those arguments out to people who don't know, right? So that are an argument that would not work against Hatun Tash because she would just make fun of it and expose the problems. If you give to some Western podcaster who doesn't study Islam and we can be exposed to his audience we could get a bunch of people who don't know any better and we can deceive them. So we could tell them about the, the perfect preservation of the Quran and they won't know. And if we can deceive enough people that way, then we can solve this problem of losing so many Muslims. And so if you look at the, the hijab crew and the Ali Dawah crew and all these guys, they now have their obsession is getting on like Western podcasts. So Hijab just got on the Jordan Peterson podcast and look at the Muslim community. Alhamdulillah, Jordan Peterson is going to convert to Islam and he's going to lead all his followers. Oh, Alhamdulillah, Jordan Peterson is converting. Look at the tears in his eyes. He is he's so moved by Islam. And if you look and now it's up, they want to be on the Joe Rogan. So they're uh, Joe Rogan is being bombarded with, with requests. You have to get Muhammad Hijab on your on your show, you have to. And uh, Logan Paul, I don't even know what kind of shows that guy does, but uh, they want to be on on Logan Paul. He's a popular YouTuber. Yeah. So now they're they're so desperate that if we can just get and and it's just insane. If if we if we just get Muhammad Hijab to talk to Logan Paul, that will solve our problems, and then the avalanche of apostasy will stop. What kind of delusional nonsense is that? That the, the problems that you have is that you've propped up your religion on, on, on foundations of lies, perfect preservation of the Quran, scientific miracles, Muhammad's in the Bible. It's complete lies. Your apologists just lied and lied and lied and lied and lied because that worked in an atmosphere of ignorance. And then people start catching on and learning responses and learning that you're deceiving them and they don't fall for it anymore. And you don't know what else to do. And so, okay, we still have to lie. We just need to get the lies out to people who aren't familiar with them. And I mean, I mean, just just think about this, Hatun, because it's the most pathetic thing I've ever heard of in my entire life. Uh, we've got the avalanche of apostasy. Every mosque you go into, there are secret apostates. Millions of ex-Muslims in the Muslim world 
uh, who are keeping quiet, millions of ex-Muslims, millions of apostates, and entire mosques are filled with them. Mosques are being led in prayers by people who are actually apostates. That's not according to me. That's according to Muslim scholars who are saying this. And they know this because yeah. they know them, right? That's the situation. And so Muslims, here's the situation you're in. What are you going to do about it? Well, all we need is Logan Paul. Logan Paul will be our savior. Jordan Peterson will be our savior. Joe Rogan will be our savior. They're, go they're going to save us from the avalanche of apostasy. What kind of fantasy land do you live in? None of these people, even if you get on every one of these platforms and you and Hijab does his Quran recitation and makes everyone's ears start bleeding with it, even if you get on every single show, even if we let you on every single show in the world and you manage to convert people with a bunch of lies, that's not going to last. It's not going to last. People are going to then find out that you lied to them. They're going to then leave Islam and, 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 and studies show over half of the people who convert to Islam leave it within two years. Over half of the people who convert to Islam leave it within two years. So suppose you get lucky, you get on Joe Rogan and a bunch of his followers who don't know anything about Islam. They, uh, they hear, oh, Muhammad's in Isaiah 42. And they say, wow, I'm going to convert because of that. Suppose, suppose 10,000 people hear that and convert. Well, studies show five, over 5,000 of those 10,000 are going to be out of Islam two years later. And so now you've got an extra 5,000 ex-Muslim apostates to deal with. There's just no winning here, Muslims. And so guess what? Jordan Peterson's not going to save you. Logan Paul's not going to save you. I was surprised that um, they were hunting down Western scholars to um, get Dawa gangs into the day program because a couple of years ago, one of the um, Dawa gangs from Speakers Corner made a video asking people to give him money because lots of people are leaving Islam and he, he wants to reach them. So he's asking people to support him financially. And the other one... Um, the um, Islamic Dawa gangs who is behind the holes in the narrative, um, part-time stripper, I call him part-time stripper, that's what he's been doing these days. Uh, he kind of destroyed the, destroyed the preservation of the Quran. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't enough. He interviewed someone who was completely disagreeing with Islam when it comes to identity and work of Lord Jesus Christ. And now he's still asking uh, Western scholars to save Islam. I just find that's very disturbing because they, they made lots of money from um, people in the intention they are going to reach ex-Muslims to make sure they don't co they become they come back to Islam or people who are doubting their faith they stuck in Islam. But it seems uh, no that didn't work. Therefore, uh, yes, Western scholars are our savior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and. Uh... And really, it's I mean, think, because if if you if you were to sit back and say, here's my here's my idea, we're going to go to all these Western uh, bloggers, these popular bloggers, and we're going to go to these Western scholars, we're going to get Bart Ehrman, and they're going to somehow save our religion from falling apart. That would that would sound like the, the most idiotic plan in the history of humanity. And yet it's it's the strategy. Now, the reason it's a strategy is there's nothing else they can do. There's, they have no, they have no plan B. Plan A was just keep lying and making stuff up until Islam takes over the world, and then no one can challenge it, and you can't speak out against it because you'll be, you'll be beheaded. Uh, so that was the plan, and now it looks like it's falling apart too soon, and they don't know what to do. They don't know what to do about it, and so, well, let's, let's, let's find people who can help us deceive uh, the community. But the idea that that's going to stop. The apostasy is just ridiculous because, uh, I mean, are you seriously thinking, oh, a Muslim finds out that Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old girl and took the wife of his own adopted son and got caught having sex with a slave girl and Allah commanded him, nope, you, you, you go back to having sex with that slave girl after you swore an oath to your wives that you would stop. And the suicide attempts and all of these things, once you find these out, do you really think, oh, but Muhammad Hijab recited the Quran to Jordan Peterson. Oh, I guess uh, I guess I'm I'm just going to stay in Islam and and not have these doubts anymore. It's ridiculous. It's insane. But this is a great time. I mean, there's never been a better time in history for Muslim dais to make their careers. 
because the community is so desperate. Their community is so desperate that they know there's this avalanche of apostasy happening, that they know that they know their their kids who are leading prayers at the mosque are actually may actually be <laughs> undercover atheists. Yeah. And they're in a panic. And so what's the solution? We need uh Zucker Dyke. Uh we need Ali Dawa. They'll they'll they're they're the only ones who can do something about that. So let's all support our, our Dawa guys. And so this is a great time. As long as you tell the Muslim community, guys, I'm the one who's going to stop people from leaving Islam. I can stop them. This is this is your time. And so Dawa is gonna be really, really popular for uh for uh, probably 2022. Eventually, people are going to realize. Wait a minute! These guys keep saying that they're going to fix the problem. The problem's just getting worse. So <laughs> yeah, I don't know what they're going to do then. Um, I was in a mosque yesterday where um, I was simply asking basic questions, and then they passed me to the trustees of the mosque, and then they passed me to imam, and then at the end they just said, "Just send us your questions in email. We will reply to you." And then they give me a couple of names um, for me to go and um, check it out so that I can learn more about Islam. Zakir Naik, um, Abdurrahman Green, <laughs> Yusuf Estas, Mohammed Hijab, <laughs> Ali Dawa, and Yasser yeah. Kadim. Yeah. And then they went to YouTube and then they're kind of searching those people to give it to me. And then I said, oh, I recently read Yasser Kadim's book. Um, he doesn't believe Quran has been perfectly preserved. Um, like... Is that like normal? Muslims don't believe Quran has been perfectly preserved. And then he says, no, he never says that. He, uh, I am sure you misunderstood him. Um, they are going to kind of get me some videos where Yasir Kadi expresses half Quran uh, preserved to the dots. Um, yep, so perfectly. I'll turn up next week <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> to get their <laughs> evidence. Um, yeah. And, and, and by the way, uh, what, what you were just talking about right there, it's exactly what I'm saying, right? It's you're raising questions. They don't have any answers. Yeah. They just they've been trained to think, ah, but our Dawa guys can answer this. Our yeah. Dawa guys have the answers. And so they're they're our saviors. And this was this was years ago. This was maybe 2009 or something. So it was before people knew it was before most people knew who Nabil and I were, but we went to, to ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America. We went to their national convention and that's where the MSA also, that, that's the student uh, wing, the MSA, the Muslim Student Association, they were having their meetings and they were having their meetings. They were having their meetings. It was called Dawa Task Force, right? So they're training in Dawa. Yeah. And so me and Nabil go in there, we sit down and we're, we're, we're watching the, the Dawa Task Force training and they're, they're they're explaining how to how to you tell them uh, uh, your book has differences in it, but our book perfectly preserved right down to the letter. And the guy who's doing the training is also uh, one of the guys behind the the Why Islam campaign. Nabil walks up to the guy afterwards and says, uh, "So, if you're saying the Quran's been perfectly preserved and no one has ever disagreed on anything and so on, what do you do with people like um, Abdullah ibn Masood, Ubay ibn Ka'ab, people like that? And the guy goes, uh, I'm sorry, I've never heard these names before. I was like, wait a minute. You never, these are Muhammad's top site, top reciters of the Quran. These were, Muhammad said, if you want to learn the Quran from anyone, learn it from these guys. But those are the guys who had different chapters in their Quran, right? And he says he's never heard of, and even if you even if you you don't do that, if you just, I mean, if you just read the hadith, if you read a Bukhari, you start seeing these names all over the place, right? Because these are also guys who who shared hadiths. Yeah. Um, and so you've got this guy who's training Muslims on perfect preservation of the Quran right down to the letter, and so, uh, but he he has no clue what he's talking about. Yeah. He has no clue what he's talking about. And what was amazing is at the end of all that, the guy says. Well, I'm sorry, I can't answer your questions because I don't know these things. Um, there is a Muslim scholar that you should get in contact get in contact with with your questions. His name is Shabir Ali. I'm giving you his contact information. It's like, wait a minute. So this is the guy that Nabil was sent to, where he could ask his question. Notice these guys. This is the yeah. Dawa Task Force. This is the Dawa Task Force. This is the guy who's training people in Dawa to use these arguments. He doesn't actually know anything he's talking about. And even when you question this guy on the basics of the basics, yeah. what about Abdullah ibn Masood? He has to say go to Shabir Ali. But what does Shabir Ali say now? He says, yes, if you go to different parts of the Muslim world, you find different it's Qurans. Different. And it doesn't really affect the meaning. But yeah, there's differences in the Quran. 
So it's just amazing that they have all this confidence in their apologists who, who are supposed to, they're going to defend what these guys are saying when their apologists are now being forced to admit, guys, this is all, this is lies. We, we, yeah. we, we lied to you all these years. And so, yeah, they're in trouble. They're in trouble. Uh, I know personally um, over 40 individuals um, who left Islam and become a Christian just because of the holes in the narrative videos. That was like numbers I kept after that. We still had mm -hmm. people, but that was the numbers I kept. Um, just add what you said is, so as a Christian, sometimes we get scared or afraid engaging with Muslims or Dawah uh, people with thinking, oh yeah, we can't answer their questions. We can't answer their questions. But what I'm seeing is, uh, you expressed as well, Muslims don't know anything basics about their faith. They know That's how true. to attack your faith, but they don't even know basics about their faith. A Muslim who never heard Ubay bin Kaab, that's disgraceful to humanity. But deep down, yes, they really don't know anything about their faith. Main reason, because they never been questioned. Therefore, it is our duty as a Christian to step in and help them to think about their faith, question their faith, and with that we will... Uh, preach our glorious gospel so that they can give up this false ideology. And and if you if you think about why that is, why the Muslim community just isn't prepared to respond to objections, well, they can't be trained to respond to those objections because in order for their leaders, their dais, to train them, the dais would have to tell them what the problem is, right? Yeah. In other words, if you if you're going to defend Muhammad's relationship with his, uh, let's say his uh, adopted son's bride, if you're gonna defend that, first you have to tell them, oh, now we're gonna train you how to respond when the Christian missionaries point out the fact that Muhammad took the wife of his own adopted son after causing the divorce by lusting after her. Um, when they bring that fact up, uh, here's how you respond. So in order to show them how to respond, they have to acknowledge the issue and they don't want to yeah. acknowledge the issue they don't want they want to they want to keep this stuff hidden from the muslim community and so what that means is the muslim community still doesn't know anything about this yeah. and so christians i mean my goodness christians atheists anyone who's going to be interacting with muslims and uh and challenging the authority of muhammad learn some basic things and again aisha is starting to become more common knowledge but apart from that, they don't know anything about about the information we normally bring up. So yeah. learn one or one or two or three things. Learn those things well, so that you have a couple sources ready. You have got them on your phone or something like that, and you could just wreak havoc uh, talking to Muslims. And and I mean, if you think because lots of people are still scared to, to people in the West have often been trained uh, if you bring up a topic uh, you know of religion, you're going to hurt someone's feelings when. Lots of Muslims would love to talk to you about Islam. So you need to get past that fear. If you just open a door for a Muslim saying, just saying, hey, you know what, what is it that you you believe? Could you tell me a little bit about that? So on. they're gonna start, they're gonna start telling, they would love to tell you about how wonderful Islam is. And then all you have to do is, oh, okay, you said Muhammad's a prophet and you said the Quran has been perfectly preserved. I have a question. How would you respond to this? Because I was reading this from, you know, website or something. I was reading this from, you know, a Hatun video where she mentioned this. And and it talks about entire chapters of the Quran coming up missing. Or, or it, it talk, this talks about, hey, I mean, they put two different Qurans side by side on the screen and it says something different. So uh, you don't even have to be you don't have to be mean. You could just say, hey, so, uh, you know, how would you explain that and leave it to them? Let them try to let them try to figure it out. And guess what? Just that, just that little thing. Hey, tell me about your religion. They're invariably going to mention a scientific miracle or perfect preservation or something like that. And as soon as they do that, you've just got it prepared. Oh, what about that? And guess what? They've never heard that before. They've never heard of it before. And you just put some information in their heads that they will never in a million years uh, hear from their leaders. Yeah. Um, and it works. You are causing them to start um, using the brain Allah given to them. Um, let me take a couple of questions because I'm aware that I kept you over an hour now. Um, so, what do you think of some Islamic critics using the term political Islam instead of Islam? And what is your favorite Christmas song? 
Uh, th that that says to uh, DCCI Ministries. <laughs> uh, oh, it says it. hi. It says hi, Hatoon and David. Um, yeah. As far as as far as using political Islam instead of Islam. Now, the the reason that we would be suspicious of that is Islam is political. So when you say political Islam, it's like you're distinguishing it from regular Islam, and uh, and as if regular Islam is not is not political. Uh, I'm actually fine with it though, because these are people who are trying to get their message out without this being an obstacle. Because as soon as you say Islam, just the, all these red flags go up and people want to start arguing, oh, you're a bigot, you're a hate monger. And then so if people just say, I'm just talking about political Islam, political Islam, yeah. And so let's talk about political Islam and the problems with political Islam. And you can kind of get a little a little further in the conversation to talk about things that are political Islam. And it's and and then you've got people who say, oh yeah, yeah, I've got a problem with that. I've got a problem with that. I've got a problem with that. And then down the line, you say, oh, by the way, that's just that's just regular Islam. And so, uh, yeah, I don't I don't have a problem if if especially people who are involved in politics, it, it's you know, we generally just blurt things out, whatever whatever you know we think and so on, and, and we're in that environment. Uh, people who are trying to get along in the media and journalism and so on, we tend to think, "Oh, you're a coward because you're saying you're saying it this way." When, if their goal is to actually get more information out there, and so, hey, if I just have to say political Islam, well, guess what? It is it is political Islam. It is political. You can say, "Hey, this is political Islam." Of course, it's political Islam. All Islam is political Islam. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't have a terrible problem with that. Uh, as far as Christmas songs, weird thing. I've never liked Christmas songs. Um, there, I mean, there, there, it, it's, it's a situation where every November, when I was a kid, I used to have to listen to the radio, right? We didn't have, we didn't have anything fancy. So I had a little radio and I would listen to the radio, but come November, they start just blasting Christmas songs 24 hours a day for an entire month and it's like all that's on the radio and i just i just i just stopped like it like my wife will play christmas songs and stuff like ah it reminds me of when i was a kid and that was all i could i could listen to and and i'd like pick out all the flaws and hey that's that's a poorly written song and so on um so it it, it probably wouldn't be any of the traditional it would like be elvis or something like that oh here comes the santa claus or here comes santa claus or like down santa claus lane uh, which is silly because that's about you know it's about Santa Claus or something like that. But yeah, just I don't know. I've never been a fan of of uh, Christmas songs. Okay. Um, you have a favorite? You have a favorite too? Um, I don't do Christmas, so I'm not good with the songs either. Um, for me, every day is Christmas, and I move on. Um, so here's another question: When a Muslim says, "Where did Jesus says he's God worship me?" What is the best scripture to tell them? Um, I've got a video on this called Where Did Jesus Say I Am God Worship Me? And uh, that advocates a certain approach. And the approach is to show where Allah says something about himself in the Quran, something that it, that only applies to Allah. And then to show now from there you could go straight to Jesus or to to add a little oomph to it you show that Yahweh in the Old Testament also said the same thing about himself and then you go and then you go and show Jesus making the same claim about himself so um if you go to the opening verse here this is just an example there's a bunch more in in my video but if you go to the opening verses of surah 57 so Surah 57, one through three, uh, it's Allah talking about himself and, all, and it says that Allah is the first and the last. So these are two of Allah's 99 names. He's giving himself this title, the first and the last. You look at the commentary, it says, because there's nothing that comes before him, there's nothing that can that can come after him. He's the, he's the first and the last. So these are uh, two of Allah's 99 names. You go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 44, and you find in the Old Testament, Yahweh making the same claim about himself, that Yahweh, God, is the first and the last. And so what? keep in mind, when, when, when I'm talking to a Muslim, I will just show them, I'll say, you read this, you read, you read this. What's Allah saying here? So who's 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 the first and the last and all these other things? They say, oh, Allah. And they go, hey, you know what's interesting is the Bible agrees that God is the first and last. So we have that common ground here. Here, here you go, right here, Isaiah 44, read this. It's Yahweh saying he's the first and the last. 
then go over to uh, to Revelation one, go to Revelation one and start reading. And then John talks about this, uh, th this someone appears to him and claims to be the first and the last. And then I say, stop, who's talking here? And with one exception, with one exception, every Muslim I've ever uh, used that approach with, when I say, who's speaking here? Someone just called himself the first and the last. I say, who's speaking here? With one exception, and this was the one exception was a guy who realized he was about to get, he was about to, <laughs> if he said this, he was about to admit that Jesus claimed to be God. Uh, with one exception, every Muslim has always instantly said either Allah or God. Say, who's, who's this talking right here? They go, oh, Allah. Or they go, oh, God, right? And then you keep reading and the, the the person who just claimed to be the first and the last said, "I was a I was I was dead and I'm alive forevermore and I hold the keys of death and of Hades," and it turns out that's Jesus speaking. And then so at that point it's wait a minute, you just you just said Jesus is God. You said that you said this is God, and it's Jesus. So you said it. Congratulations, you're no longer a Muslim. You're an apostate now. Um, there's no forgiveness for. Uh, for shirk in Islam, so you need to get you need to be forgiven some other way. And so, hey, let me tell you the gospel, and you can sort of transition mm -hmm. into it uh, that way. So, so anyway, the, the the point of all that was, you have the traditional proof texts that we normally go to to defend the deity of Christ. But if you're talking particularly to Muslims, you can actually make a stronger case by going to some different passages where. Jesus says the same thing that Allah says. It's not because we believe in the Quran or anything like that. It's this prevents reinterpretation. Because if you say, look, Jesus says that he's the I am of the Exodus right there. They'll, oh, what Jesus really means here is, and then they'll reinterpret it. You're talking to people who reinterpret everything in their own text. Obviously, they can reinterpret everything uh, that, that you quote from the Bible. But once you show that Allah himself is the only one who can make a claim about himself, and you show that Jesus made the exact same claim about himself, it makes it very difficult to reinterpret it. Because if you're saying, oh, well, what Jesus meant when he claimed to be the first and the last, like, wait a minute, what? You're telling me, you're telling me, Jesus, <laughs> you're telling me a God's prophet who's doing everything he can to convince people that there's one God, that there's one God, and there's no partners with him. He just goes around claiming all these titles and attributes of God, but doesn't really mean them. He means something else. And so uh, I think you can make a stronger case that way. Um, and please do watch the videos on, on David's channel because it will um, help you to kind of get the reputation and learn, learn quicker and practice it first. And then if it doesn't work, come back to us. But it does work. It does work. Um, another, this is the last question I'm going to take, if that's okay. Um, can you um, tell us um, how did uh, Umar um, enter the Jerusalem in real history? Um, uh, yeah, I don't know what this question. See, notice there are two ways to interpret this question. One is asking, "Hey, what happened yeah. with Umar? Can, can you tell me what happened?" And the other is, "Can I really know? <laughs> can I know what exactly happened? Like, can I know this? Like, ha like how strong are our sources?" Um, so yeah, if, if you mean, can we really know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure about that. Right. As far as, as far as the details, what, what I mean there is, I think you can make a good case that, that Umar, um, entered Jerusalem. As far as the details, you were talking about some, some, some fairly weak sources on exactly what happened. I mean, by the time they take Jerusalem, it sounded, it, I mean, that they, they seem to think that Muhammad was still alive during this time, even though Muhammad's already dead. I mean, some of the, you know, our, our, one of our earliest mentions that there was someone named Muhammad, he was still supposedly alive after his death. So the timeline yeah. doesn't even, the timeline doesn't even match up. Uh, but yeah, the, the claim the claim is that Umar shows up and uh, and then it's 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 a largely peaceful takeover. Um, what what do you what do you think on that, Hatun? Um, I do, I don't know actually fully how did um, Umar enter the um, Jerusalem, but I know that Islam is religion of pieces. 
it might have something to do with it. But I can I can check it. Like I never needed to kind of use that in my um, discussion, so I, it's not in my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I only hear that. I only hear this. I only hear about this from basically Muslims who are trying to show that Islam is a religion of peace. We quote a bunch of passages from Muhammad and the Quran, and they say, ah, but when Umar did this, and they give examples from later Islamic history, which are supposed to show that Islam isn't as bad as the Muslim sources uh, sound. Umar, Umar is identified as very uh, bloody caliph in Muslim tradition and in Muslim. Yeah, circle. he was hardcore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, no, I mean, I mean, th that was the guy who, if someone disagreed with Muhammad, Umar would say, "You want me to kill this guy? You want me to kill this guy?" Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think we will stop there because I kept you like nearly one and a half an hour. Thank you very much um, for mm -hmm. being with us, uh, brother. Um, is there anything we can um, pray for you? What's uh, happening in What's happening in your life? What are the things we can pray for? Well, people can always, yeah, people can always uh, pray for me if they want. Uh, we have ongoing situations with uh, nursing. We have we have five sons, and two of them are uh, special needs. They have a they have a rare genetic muscle disease, and uh, ever since COVID, uh, it's been it's been trouble finding reliable nursing. So, uh, but I mean, at the end of the day, we're we're fine. We just ha we just have a situation where Marie takes care of them during the day i take care of them at night and i mean we've we've done that we've done that before there's been other situations in uh there's been other situations where we haven't had nurses and so on and so uh we we, we adapt to that but it is uh does make it difficult to travel or to get a lot done during during the day uh, so that's one issue and uh other than that it's uh it's this is an awesome time i mean this is if you have a if you want to reach muslims with the gospel and you want to refute Islam, there is no better time in history. I mean, 14 centuries of Islam, you right now, everyone, you all, everyone who's watching, this is the greatest time in history for refuting Islam. So even though it may, you know, there may be disheartening things that happen. Oh, you know, Congress just passed a bill against Islamophobia and uh, this social media platform keeps banning stuff as as hate speech, even though things like that maybe may make you go, ah, oh, this is this this sucks so bad. Do not lose sight of the fact that there is has never been a greater time in all of history to reach Muslims with the gospel and to refute Islam. This is the, you are. I mean, if you I mean, if you think about it, I mean, previous generations, if you wanted to preach the gospel to Muslim, you had to go travel to travel to a Muslim country, and if you were at all successful someone's going to chop your head off for reaching Muslims with the gospel. And now you could talk to a Muslim in Pakistan or Saudi Arabia right now on your, on your, on, 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 you know, on Facebook, on your cell phone. It's, it's insane. No one has ever had these kind of opportunities. Uh, one, to expose Islam and two, to share the gospel with Muslims. So my goodness, my goodness, you recognize the time you're in right now and take advantage of this time because it's, uh, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. And, um, we are very grateful for you to um, help us to think our, up, up, our approach as well as encouraging us to um, expose the ideology of Islam and preaching our glorious gospel. So we are very much thankful and um, all the beloved ones, I just want to encourage them to remember you and your family in their prayer. And once again, thank you very much for joining us, especially while you've got like busy and different life circle, um, you made yourself available for us. So thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. And I just, uh, we put on the uh, chat, uh, Patreon for um, Ap uh, Act 17 Apologetics. If you are not um, supporting, um, David Wood, and uh, please do prayfully consider and check the Patreon account. I'll put that in the description as well. We can serve our brothers as well. Um, and thank you very much for all moderators for serving us in the chat. And as well as well, as well thank you very much, everyone who joined us. Uh, may Christ crucified silently with his love. We will see you at Speaker's Corner um, tomorrow. God bless you all.